Hello, welcome to another episode of the Tai Chi Notebook podcast. My guest today is Simon Cox, who runs the Okanagan Valley Wudang Centre with his wife Brandy in Penticton, British Columbia. Simon and Brandy both spent six years living and training in China under Master Yuan Shugang at the Wudang Taoist Traditional Kung Fu Academy on Wudang Mountain. While there, they studied Kung Fu, Tai Chi, Qigong, meditation, herbal medicine, Taoist music, and ancient and modern Chinese language. After returning to the West, they started a Kung Fu school and community group in Houston, Texas, where Simon was working on his PhD in Chinese and Tibetan mysticism at Rice University. At the end of 2019, they moved up to Okanagan Valley, where they began sharing Wudang teachings with the local community. What I really wanted to get at with Simon was his elucidation of his article about Jansen Fung, exactly who this mysterious Taoist immortal who's often credited as the founder of Tai Chi Chuan was and why he's credited as the founder. I also wanted to find out more about Wudang Mountain and where its martial arts really come from. So here he is, Simon Cox. Hi Simon, how are you doing? I'm great Graham, good to be here. Yeah, nice to talk to you finally. We've been trying to do this for ages and I think we finally got around to it. Yeah. I believe we have a mutual friend, Daniel Moroz. Yeah, yeah. I spent a week with Daniel about a year ago in Ottawa just doing martial arts together. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, he's a he's a great guy. We are part of the Brotherhood of the Claw, which only he and I know about. Well, everyone knows oh. it now, so uh, <laughs> we'll have to include you in it somehow. <laughs> yeah, cool. I'm a fan of esoteric societies. Yeah, it's so esoteric, we, we only meet once a lifetime. No. Oh. <laughs> That's, maybe, maybe we can do it twice, I don't know. Once a century? Nice, Yeah, like it. So, um, do you want to just tell my listeners about yourself? Because you're, you're, you've got a training facility in, I need to say this right, Okangang Valley? Is that close? Almost. O- the Okanagan Valley. Okay. A little town called Penticton. But you actually trained on Wudang Mountain, which is very cool. Do you want to tell us a bit about all that? Yeah. Yeah. So, let's see, I graduated from college in 2008 and I mo- immediately moved to Wudong Mountain um, September of that year and started studying under Master Yuan there at the Wudong Traditional Kung Fu Academy uh, based out of the Yushu Gong, the Yushu Temple, like the biggest temple complex on uh, Wudong. Mm-hmm. Yeah. In 2009, he kind of started this like five year program where he was going to teach the whole lineage to a group of, of foreigners. There were kind of 12 of us who went through this program starting in 09 and ending in 2014. And we learned, well, you know, pretty much everything, the whole curriculum as our Master Yuan laid it out in a lineage, including, yeah, Taiji Xing Yi Bagua, this kind of Northern Long Fist style. There's like a kind of Wudang Baji that's just the kind of Guoshu Baji form. It's been kind of folded into the Wudang Northern style. Eight Immortals, uh, Sword, Staff, and Fist. And, and then not to mention there's whole Qigong curriculum and then the main practice was the Neda and the inner alchemy, seated meditation practice. Right. Um, in addition to that, we did tons of, I mean, we did Taoist chanting and we studied herbs and just kind of the theoretical stuff. We went through a number of Taoist scriptures with Master Yuan. The idea was it was a kind of like exhaustive Taoist uh, education. And then in 2014, I immediately went into grad school and started writing my PhD. Well, it, my PhD ended up being on the topic of the subtle body. And I recently published uh, my dissertation through Oxford, a book called The Subtle Body, A Genealogy. Yeah, then in 2019, I finished my PhD, and then I moved up to Canada, the goal of starting my own kung fu school in this very beautiful place. Mm. And then COVID hit, and so we basically taught kung fu out of a park for a few years. And then last year, we finally opened our, our kind of own location, and that's been the kind of my main occupation ever since. Nice. So what what was it that got you to Wudang in the first place then? I mean, obviously everyone's heard about Wudang as being the, the famous place for Taoism, but but you actually went there and stayed there for a few years. Well, of course, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon was the first place I heard of it. That came out when I was like 13 or 14, so I was just like the perfect age for it. I went to see it in the movie theater and it just blew my mind. But they, they actually, in the, the subtitles into that, they romanized it incorrectly. It was Wudan with W-U-D-A-N. Um, and so I was like, what is this Wudan place? And so I was Googling for Wudan for a few years and finding nothing. And then I realized, oh, it's the, there's a G at the end. And then I found, oh, it's an actual place. There are people there. And so in 2003, I actually found Master Yuan, his website. Well, someone else had made a website for him. 
on the internet and I saw this master. He was at Purple Cloud Palace at that time. Mm. And he was listed as like a master of hard qigong. I don't know why. I mean, he does hard qigong and stuff, but it's by no means a specialty. So then I was like, I want to go eventually study with this guy. I was only 16 at that time. And so that that's kind of, and I set the intention pretty early as a teenager. But I was training more seriously in Japanese martial arts in the Bujinkan, kind of ninjutsu. Mm. And I, I traveled to Japan in 2004 and 2006 to train with Hatsumi Sensei and his main students. And I just loved that art. And so when I was in undergrad, I actually studied Japanese, modern Japanese language. My whole intention was to find a job in Japan after I graduated in 08 and then moved to Japan to just study ninjutsu. Are you familiar with that stuff? I, I know what ninjutsu is, but I've just got this idea that it's all made up. <laughs> and yeah, it wouldn't it, be something I want to go a long way to study. I, yeah, I yeah. kind of think, well, that's just, you know, people have made this up. It's not real. But I mean, uh -huh. maybe it is. I don't know. It uh, It does have a tenuous relationship with history <laughs> you might say yeah <laughs> so uh, there are people out there doing really good actually historical work trying to historically validate some of these teachings that teacher Hatsumi Sensei who's a somewhat controversial figure mm. um, in the kind of Japanese martial arts circles has been teaching since the really since the 1970s and 1960s so yeah they're doing that historical work but I mean since as someone like kind of professionally trained historian I see it's mostly quite kind of circumstantial and it's really difficult to like find direct these solid historical links with this sort of thing. Mm. So yeah, if if you're someone who's like really perturbed by kind of historical realism in your martial arts, then you'll probably um, kind of steer clear of ninjutsu. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but it's the same. So uh, as someone, I mean, uh, clearly, I'm I'm attracted to these sort of mis more mystical martial arts that have murkier kind of historical situations, which is mm. part of what yeah. also attracted me to wudong. Yeah. Um, and so. Yeah, I, I couldn't find a job in Japan. I couldn't study ninjutsu with, if I didn't have a job and live in Japan. So, uh, but I, I had saved up a little bit of money. It was enough to go study at this temple in China in 2008. And so that's that's kind of why I went there. I kind of, on a whim, I just needed to get out of where I was living, Houston. I wanted to get to Asia and I didn't really care where it was, I guess. <laughs> it's very similar. Yeah. Have, you, have you read American Shaolin? Uh, no, I haven't. Actually. Matthew Polly's book. It's about his... Very similar to you, he wanted to. He saw the Kung Fu TV series and wanted to become a Shaolin monk and go and study in Shaolin Temple. And very, very similar story. He 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 googled, googled it up and just found it on a map and went there. You know. Yeah. I was just thinking you could actually write one of the like a very similar sort of biography of American Taoist or something. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I've, I I I toyed with writing something like that while I was there, but. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm as you you've seen my website. I'm kind of I'm finally kind of laying things out, my experience and the history of this stuff. Mm. Um, but it's uh, kind of it's a process. So I, I never felt confident enough to like form everything into like a, a single monograph that contained my experience there, because that that felt kind of too limiting, too kind of crystallizing uh, of of like kind of what I what I experienced and went through. So I like to keep it a little bit uh, mm. alive still. And I feel like when you write something down. There's something, I mean, it's great to write things down, but you also kind of lock it into a certain framework. Yeah, yeah, I guess you do, yeah. I'd read it if you wrote it anyway, I'm just saying. Mm -hmm. I think you should write it. Cool. I'll like, continue to consider it. <laughs> yeah, cause, yeah. please please don't stop on that idea. I'd like I'd like to read it. All right, so the other reason we, we, we got to do this podcast is you've written a great article on Zhangson Feng, the legendary Taoist, Mm -hmm. about how he is actually a collection of various people for our history who had the same name and all, all become the same person. Then his connection to Tai Chi in the kind of in the Qing dynasty, then into the into the Republican era. Do you want to just tell us how, I don't know whether you say Zhang or Chang, how would you say it? Oh, um, I say Zhang. Zhang, okay. Yeah. Zhang relates to Wu Dang and then later on into Tai Chi. Yeah, the, the way, so just a kind of, Disclaimer, the way I speak Chinese words is not going to sound like very proper. I learned my Chinese in Wudong, where they have a pretty thick, like Hubei, kind of a southern accent, basically. Mm. And so Zhang would be how like you'd say it with like a Beijing accent. But they say Zhang, kind of a softer DZ kind of sound. Yeah. That's just if, if, if my Chinese sounds weird to people who know Chinese, it's because I'm speaking with like a Hubei accent. And Hubei is actually a, a kind of a subdialect of Sichuanese rather than the kind of Mandarin, uh, technically speaking. But yeah, Zhang Sanfeng, yeah, he's 
I mean, he's such he's such an interesting and kind of problematic character. Like I think inherently a trickster kind of character. Yeah. So we were part. We were the Sanfeng lineage in in China. In China the Sanfeng Pai. Um, it claims to be like this Wudong Sanfeng Pai, and the kind of emic historical position is that this goes directly back to this wild a Taoist immortal who was alive certainly in the Ming Dynasty possibly into the Yuan Dynasty, maybe even into the Song Dynasty, you know, several hundred years, no problem in the kind of like Taoist historical view. <laughs> and that these teachings were transmitted from him and to like from disciple to disciple into the present day, right? And so this is a, a really interesting kind of mytho-historical claim, but uh, if you try to really corroborate it with historical sources, you run into lots of problems just because of the kind of fragmentary nature of tradition when it comes to like esoteric practices and societies, which like kind of like your what what's your white claw society? The tiger. The ti- oh tiger claw society. Tiger, yeah. Okay. Tiger claw society, yeah. White white claw sounds even more esoteric. Maybe we should rename it. <laughs> I'll have to yeah. consult with Daniel as the, the founding <laughs> impetus. <laughs> yeah. Well yeah, so just like your 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 society that you know no one's ever heard of. And if the, these <laughs> things try to keep themselves under wraps. So so anyway, I started just poking around, studying around, reading on this figure while I was in China. And yeah, it was actually on my master's computer. I would go on his computer and like kind of abscond with his notes periodically. And I found an essay that w- it was just sort of like, oh, there's this Zhang Sanfeng, there's this one, there's that one, there's that one. And it just had a list of all of these Zhang Sanfeng that existed throughout history. Mm. And there was the one guy who was like the master of this is from like the sixth dynasties period. So we're talking, you know, uh, fifth, sixth century there and then there was a sort of a calligrapher alchemist from the Song Dynasty and then there was the kind of alchemy martial arts guy from the Ming Dynasty and there were the in this essay and there was another essay I found actually by Zhao Jianying who was kind of one of the masters in our lineage who brought the kind of Taiji Wuxing Tran style back and she talked about how Taiji is basically like an umbrella category that just kind of contains a whole bunch of different martial arts kind of lumped under this together under this thing. But it's a very kind of cursory treatment of this sort of thing. And so these were the two essays that really got me thinking in this way. Like, it really seems like Zhang Sanfeng is a kind of concatenation of a bunch of different historical figures, which makes sense. His, nar- his name is fairly generic. Zhang is one of, like, the, the Lao Bai Xing, like, the hundred old names, most common, uh, like, name, last names in China. Mm. And then San Sanfeng, as I kind of point out in this article, is actually... San is like three bro- three unbroken lines, and then Feng is three lines with, with a strike through it. So it symbolizes the kind of heaven and earth uh, trigrams from the I Ching. So it basically means like yin yang zhang is kind of like yeah. the, the meaning of the name. And so that multiple people would have taken on this kind of epithet for Chinese history. And in China, people take on epithets like, like crazy. Everyone has like five different names. Especially in Chinese martial arts, everyone's famous for something, you know. <laughs> yeah, uh-huh. Yeah, everybody has their own little hill where they're the, the king. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah, that, that's this idea that Zhang Zanfeng is a sort of a, a hybrid figure. And it, it, he actually maps really well onto a figure that out of the Buddhist tradition, Nagarjuna, who's also like this. And Nagarjuna, there's been a lot of really wonderful scholarship done on him. And so I, I have a quote of just like a list of a kind of laundry list of all the Nagarjunas by David Gordon White, who's a scholar of Tantra. But uh, there's a whole book called Nagarjuniana. I forget the author, but it, it's this really cool book, and it's an overview of all of the stuff that's attributed to this figure, Nagarjuna. And it's just, it's all over the place. Uh, he's done everything. And so I think there's a similar dynamic at play with this Jiang Zanfeng character in Chinese history. He's a kind of compelling kind of folk hero, um, mm. a trickster, um, and kind of a bit deviant. He's lata, he's sloppy, and he kind of rides the line between reality and fiction as well. And so if he seems like a problematic historical figure, that's not an accident. That's like actually a central feature of this kind of, this trickster archetype Mm. that he embodies, I think. So could you say that claiming him as the founder of a martial art is perhaps a little joke because, you know, if he's a trickster, then is it a little sort of sly wink to, maybe this isn't true, but it's a good story. (laughs) Yeah, well... That and also, I think, like, claims to, like, be the founder of this or that in Chinese history are, there's a kind of whole different historical framework that, that's kind of brought to bear when you're talking about Chinese historical context 
mm. as opposed to kind of Western, a uh, kind of Protestant normativity that we're operating from in the West. And so if you look at almost any martial art in China, that none of them have strictly speaking historical founders. Everything claims a semi-mythological figure, kind of at the very least. Apart from often one of my favorites, Shingi. <laughs> Shingi? It claims a well, historical I'm, founder. Well, yeah. So UFA, are you talking about the yeah, the yeah. Sea general. There's a yeah. there's a tomb of a body in for that one. So <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. So yeah, but I mean UFA. There's the UFA that the kind of Song Dynasty general, but then there's also UFA, the, the kind of highly hero. mythologized folk hero. And yeah. so, yeah. so I think yeah. So there's always a kind of kernel of historical truth to these things, but then they've been highly kind of mythologized. Yeah, yeah. even kind of with his, within his own lifetime that was beginning. Hmm. Um, and so. I think the same thing applies to Jiang Sanfeng and to kind of the, the Bodhidharma as the founder of Shaolin, right? All of this stuff. There's like, there's something there historically, but you, you're not actually making an historical claim when you say this necessarily. You need a more kind of sophisticated hermeneutical lens to, to really kind of bring out what's going on in these kind of uh, historical claims, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Our, our platonic idea of um, labels and you know, putting things in boxes that we got from Plato, that it doesn't agree with the Chinese version of history sometimes. And it's especially lineages as well. A very Western idea of teacher, student, teacher, student going back, you know, whereas in, in China, it's a much more fluid thing. It's not as literal as we like to think of it in the West. Yeah. And I mean, it gets even more problematic when you have things like, for example, the character Zhang Sanfeng continued to, to teach things into the, at least the 19th century through kind of spirit medium stuff yeah yeah that's right yeah. so you would have this text was by Zhang Sanfeng it was written in 1844 it yeah we it, we received it through a spirit so that's <laughs> this is another like kind of thing that, that that's really kind of I think problematic for, for westerners when they're approaching this stuff without a kind of sufficiently rigorous understanding of the the basic framework of Chinese history and and religion is, is kind of I, I'm coming at this as a scholar of religion mm. so it's the religious aspects of this stuff that really really fascinate me Mm. Even in Chinese politics, if you're looking at Chinese politics in the Ming Dynasty, there it's a cosmopolitics that involves spirits. Like <laughs> yeah. you can't. So yeah, th there's Western kind of Protestant historiography that tends to really simplify things, and also there's kind of modern communist historiography that looks back through time and erases all of the kind of religious and spiritual like layers that are upon things, and mm. just looks at kind of material historical causality and conditions. And both of those basically erase most of the stuff that's significant when it comes to Chinese martial arts is kind of my larger argument, you know? Absolutely, yeah. Fascinating. And at some point, he, he gets added to Tai Chi as the founder, doesn't he? But not immediately, which is interesting. I've been looking back through the... I mean, I always go on this website called Brennan Translation that has... Uh, oh, yeah, it's great. Yeah, it's just it's such a great catalogue. And, and it's, it's arranged in um, order of time. So you can start from the very first documents and then it... You can say, so, okay, so where does Zhang Sanfang appear? And I, the first time I could find him in the Tai Chi documents or manuals that were on there was Sun Lu Tang's 1921. I mean, maybe he's a bit earlier than that. I don't know. But that's the first one I could find. Yeah. But there, yeah, are, there are older Tai Chi books on there that don't have him in. In fact, they don't talk mm -hmm. about the origins at all. They just go straight into like the songs, you know, where where there is entering, there is also retreating and where there is, you know, those sort of mm -hmm. poetic type descriptions of a martial art. Yeah, it's it's very late. So I mean, the earliest mention of of Zhang Sanfeng in relation to martial arts is the that the kind of epitaph for Huang Zongxi in, in the kind of um, mid seventeenth century, um, where he's attached to this. He's like the internal the Neja Tran guy. Mm -hmm. But of course, they don't mention Tai Chi there. It's just internal the in, internal family fist, and then Shaolin and Bodhidharma is the Waija, the kind of external fist. I do remember this one time I saw a, a text. It was an inscription from the Ming Dynasty, and I didn't I didn't take notes on this. It was really early days when I was researching this stuff in China, mm -hmm. and it mentioned Zhang Sanfeng in relation to horseback archery. Actually, like a so I was like, oh, that's really fascinating. A very early thing about him and a martial thing, but it's like horseback. So anyway, th that's another thing. I'm, I continue to look for what the, where the hell that was. <laughs> So, so yeah, you can't. I, I'm not making a historical claim there because I, I don't have the footnote for that one, but I'm, I'm looking for it because I did see it. No, ago. interesting because that was oh. horseback archery was it was a like when the Mongols were invading China, that was a big thing. So yeah, mm -hmm. it was you know pre Yuan Dynasty. 
the memory of, of Jiang Sanfeng around Wudong is totally intertwined with the kind of Red Turban Rebellion and kicking out the Mongols in the, in the 14th century because he was remembered as a kind of the guy who restored Taoism to a, a destroyed Wudong. Yeah, I mean, the final battle of the of the Song Dynasty was the Battle of Xiangyang, which was just a, a kind of about an hour from, from Wudang Mountain. It was a huge, huge, massive battle, and Wudang itself, like, suffered in, in the kind of after effects of that battle, supposedly. So Wudang was kind of, like, wrecked during the, the, the Mongol era. And then there was this kind of Zhang Sanfeng comes back at the beginning of the Ming Dynasty and restores Wudang. And then the third emperor of the Ming Dynasty patronizes the whole place and, and builds it out to see, to kind of the glory of what it is today. So that, that's kind of how Jiang Zanfeng is remembered in kind of the Wudang memory. In, in the, as far as the martial arts stuff goes, yeah, it's kind of 17th century internal fist. And then the beginning of the 20th century is when he gets attached to this Taiji fist. Um, and the first, uh, the first place I, I've traced it back to is the Taiji Tranjing, the Taiji fist classics published by Guan Baiyi, who was a kind of Chinese archaeologist in 1912. So right after right. the fall of the Qing dynasty. And this is something Daniel and I have talked about a number of times. We've gone back and forth on this because actually the term Taiji Tran doesn't actually really show up until that. Mm. If you look at the kind of earlier documents pre-Republican era, none of them actually call it Taiji Tran. And there's, for example, a kind of 1880s book by Yang Ban Ho, but that was only unearthed in like the 1970s. So a lot of these things have really, really a lot of the earlier Taiji sources in the late 19th century themselves have very kind of shaky provenance to them. Well, yeah, what's interesting so is those, those, like the Yang Bang Ho one, the Tai Chi appears in the title of the book, but I can't work mm -hmm. out whether the title was added later or... Exactly. He doesn't mention yeah. Tai Chi, the words Tai Chi Chuan at all in the text, but it's right. definitely in the mm -hmm. title. And it's the same with the handwritten notes that are 1864, the classics, by, mm -hmm. by Lee. They, again, the, the, the word Tai Chi Chuan is in the title of the document, but because I don't read Chinese and there are photos of the actual pages, I can't tell whether yeah. they've just added a title on or whether, <laughs> you know, yeah, there's nothing in the text saying that. Mm -hmm. thing. Yeah. Yeah. And if you look at the provenance a lot, also, I mean, Douglas Weil has done really, really great treatment of all of this stuff, you know, mm. but uh, yeah, it, it does. It takes a little bit of kind of rhetorical generosity to accept that these texts actually talk about Tai Chi in, in the late Qing dynasty. And I think there's a place where Douglas Weil talks about the possibility that actually these things were called Chai Chi Tran, but they didn't publish those in written documents because of a, a taboo, because Tai Chi was a kind of official imperial name mm. of, was it one of the emperors of the Qing dynasty or something like that? I forget. But you, you if, if the emperor took that name, then you couldn't use that term in any documents. And so... The reason that we don't actually see the term Taiji Tran until 1912, until the fall of the Qing dynasty, is because of that. But it's suddenly, boom, the dynasty's over, and now we can use all of the terms again. So I think that's uh, that's a quite interesting kind of thing to investigate. But yeah, yeah. And in mm -hmm. email to Daniel, I, I told him that like from a that from the most like ten densest of historical positions, where we're just like just looking at the text in front of us, things with really solid provenance, that there there's no evidence anyone used the term Tai Chi Tran before the fall of the Qing dynasty, which is like, wow, it's super late, right? Yeah, yeah. And that that's where they start, they tie like, oh, this and Zhang Sanfeng, these are related. And uh, yeah, so he gets tied there in the kind of 19 teens, in the 20s. And then it seems like Chen gets, Chen gets brought into the conversation in 1930. Yeah, which, I mean, th this is where it gets controversial because the, you know, if you're a, a Chen supporter, then you do the original Tai Chi, end of. There's no, there's no further discussion. Mm -hmm. There's this strange... I mean, it, it, if there were any records that the Chen family boxing was called Tai Chi before 1930, you know, <laughs> it would be really convenient, but there just isn't, is there? It's, uh, I mean, obviously the Chen family had boxing. They were famous for it. You know, they, mm -hmm. they, they trained militia and they, they had bodyguarding skills and they were, you know, famous martial artists, but it wasn't until 1930, which is really late, when when um, when he gets to Beijing, that it suddenly, you know, he sort of takes over the Tai Chi business, which is yeah very profitable, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and he was probably yeah. quite a tough guy, and like no one was going to argue with him really. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, that helps. Yeah, so so who knows? And and also like you say with the communist lens looking back through history, where they just eradicate everything that doesn't fit the narrative. The Communist Party decided that Chen 
was the place where Tai Chi was born, and that was the end of that discussion. And so nobody can disagree with it now publicly without facing some sort of backlash, you know. So it kind of stifled yeah. debate at that point. <laughs> yeah, yeah, this is something that uh, Douglas Weil, I forget what the name of the book is, but he brings that, he kind of draws this this kind of duality between kind of like the traditionalists who are like, oh, Jiang San Feng created it, this Taoist magical mystic, and it's all been transmitted through esoteric means. You can't trace it historically, but it's just, this is the way it is. Mm. And then the kind of like, the kind of new kind of communist historicism of Tom Howe, who goes back and he like investigates the villages and he puts together this thing where it's, it's actually a very communist narrative. Mm. Where it's like, oh, they were like the people, the the Chen kind of the villagers, the proletariat, and they put together this art and and so on and so forth. So basically, th th I mean, this is where I kind of as a scholar of religion, I find it really interesting. The two kind of historical frameworks for thinking about Tai Chi are both myth mythological. There's the kind of like there's a, some, a kind of like Taoist mythological lens you can take, or a kind of communist mythological lens you can take. And that's the kind of hermeneutical field that everybody is implicated in when they're talking about the history of Tai Chi right now, uh, which is kind of, and so just in this conversation, Graham, I think you and I, we're, we're speaking a little bit outside of this framework now, which is, which is cool, which is, that's kind of what I'm trying to do on our website. Cause I, I had all this historical information I'd collected in my years in China and stuff, but I didn't really feel any impetus to share it publicly. Mm. Um, but I saw, you know, I saw on, on the internet, a lot of being like, oh, all Wudong stuff is just made up it's kind of a uh, communist party uh modern wushu created in 1980s or something like that and i was like uh you know i don't really care about that but then i saw people from my own lineage going online and being like no it's not that it's a pristine transmission from the ming dynasty and everything is literally was created then and transmitted and nothing's <laughs> changed since and i was like okay okay these are both very very wrong so now okay i'll introduce a little bit of nuance to this conversation yeah 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 i mean like you say in your article that there are clearly Taoist movement practices on Wudang for hundreds yeah. of years, you know. Yeah. And that's what it draws on as an inspiration for what we call Tai Chi on Wudang today, I guess. So it, it's not unconnected to history. There, There's definitely something there. But like you say, it's probably yeah. not this. It was created the Ming Dynasty and unchanged presented to us <laughs> now because it can't yeah. be because it looks very similar to modern things, you know. So yeah, totally. How, how could that possibly be the case if it wasn't actually influenced by modern things as well? You know. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. Precisely. Yeah. So nuance, yeah. you know. Yeah, I mean, I've looked through all the. You've, you've got a very generous selection of videos on your website, by the way, so you can actually yeah. see all the arts you're talking about. Because you have a, like you say at, at the start, you've got a huge collection. You've got these sword arts. You've got, you know, Chingi, Bagua, Tai Chi. You, you can look at. You can look at exactly what you're talking about, and. You know, I, 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 I was looking through some of the, the videos and like some of the Tai Chi or, or in fact, it, the most interesting thing I thought was the sword ones, the the dark sword, is it called? Yeah, Xuan Men Jen, yeah. Yeah, because some of those look, some of the sword bits looked like things that were influenced by like stuff going on in the Koshu movement in the 30s. Very similar to that. and But then other parts of it looked I mean, it's hard to look at something and go, that looks older, but they, you know, to me, it looked like something that wasn't influenced by a, by a modern wushu movement. It, it had more sort of flowy, detailed, intricate movements and, and, and less designed for teaching large groups of people, which I think a lot of that, mm. that modern stuff, it's designed to be taught to big groups. Whereas like, you know, I think the, one of the dark sword forms I saw was like, oh, that, that's actually very rich. Like there's no way you could teach that to a group of people. It just wouldn't work, you know. There's yeah. too much. There's too much nuance to it and too much detail, you know. Yeah. No, that's cool. And yeah, I think I I'm, I understand your like reservation to like look at something and being like that looks new, that looks old. But I think we kind of can't help ourselves when we're in embroiled in kind of classical Chinese martial arts. You, you get a sense of like just a you got a kind of morphological vision where you can see oh that's sort of guoshu ish, that's sort of modern, that looks archaic. And so yeah, for for when like our Taiyi Wuxing Tran form, it looks, it's very, very weird. For me, it looks like very old. Whereas some of our more like the Taiji we do is clearly kind of in the kind of Yang Chen milieu. It kind of was influenced, cooked up in, in this sort of stuff. Um, but uh, yeah, the the Dark Sword, Tremen Jian, that's an interesting case because um, there is actually a manual was written about that sword form in 1935 um, by a guy who was involved in the Guoshu Institute. 
Um, and it, if you look through that manual, and I've, I'm, I'm about halfway through translating it, um, it uh, it's actually a much dumbed down, simplified version of the form that we learned in Wudang. Um, yeah, yeah, so, yeah, that makes sense. So it, yeah, it's quite interesting. The whole thing was to try and teach it to lots of people, wasn't it? Because they wanted to take the obscure subject of martial arts and turn it into some sort of nation building fitness yeah. journey, didn't they? For, for everyone to go on. So you, you can't have detailed complex movements if you're doing that so it's no surprise yeah. the manual is a simplified version yeah that mm -hmm. makes sense yeah precisely yeah what's your favorite of all the arts you do oh bagua yeah that's oh bagua. interesting yeah um i've never been able to get into that <laughs> no no i don't it's weird isn't it why not i don't know i don't know i mean maybe you just haven't met the right person <laughs> to get me into it you know but i don't know i like the idea of walking around in a circle doing stuff <laughs> like yeah. the, in my head that's a really good idea but i just i've had a few like like we were talking about monkey before Mon our, our monkeys a monkey and bagua have a lot of similarities they I mean, they're not, historically they were they i think they've shared a lot of stuff because they were you know shingi and bagua were always trained together at a certain point in history mm -hmm. i think there's a lot of crossover and it, it, for me it's monkey and yeah and bagua um cool so but I tried doing monkey stuff in a circle and I just end up drifting back to just doing monkey thinking, why am I walking in a circle? <laughs> 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 so it's, it's never really worked out for me. So, uh, yeah. But I, then again, I haven't met, I, I, I haven't met anyone who's done Bagua in a way that I've gone, wow, I should learn that. That is good. Uh -huh. So I think that's yeah. probably the, the problem. I think if I met someone yeah. who I could like take as a role model, it would be different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. Yeah, I mean, what what really attracted me to Wudong when I went there the first time I was the Eight Immortal Sword and the uh, the Bagua. And specific, it wasn't even the Bagua. It was actually a video. I didn't know this at the time, but of our master doing Jogong, which is the higher level practice in Bagua. Right. Um, so the, the Bagua practice in our lineage is kind of there's eight palms, um, like eight little mini forms, and you just do uh, kind of the walking in between. Uh, but then uh, once you kind of become sufficiently good at that, you do jogong, which is the na there's nine posts in the ground, and there's no jogong form. Uh, there's not a form, but what you do is you take the kind of fixed postures that you start with the walking practice and then the kind of motions of the eight palms, mm. uh, and then there's a couple more things you mix in, uh, and you kind of freestyle yeah. uh, between all these nine posts. So I, just, I really love Bagua because it begins from like a very constrained, like standing and walking meditation practice goes all the way through like a kind of a highly choreographed and sophisticated Chinese martial art, and then moves into sort of like freestyle, like jazz territory. Um, and, yeah. and everything is on both sides. You, you always do both sides equally, which I also uh, love that too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's a big thing in uh, Chinese martial arts I find is, is doing both sides. Because in jiu-jitsu, I, I do things on my right side and things on my left side. And I just, the amount of time it would take me to do things on both sides would be astronomical. Like, because, mm -hmm. you know, it's, I mean, I can do them on both sides, but can you do it in the heat of the moment when you're sparring on both yeah. sides? That, that you know, you, mm -hmm. you've got to really practice it so much that you don't have to think about something and just do it. So I tend to have... Yeah. On my right side, I'll do this sort of backstep thing if I'm passing a guard. On my left side, it'll be more like a knee slide. So it's just the way my brain works now is that, you know, that's burned in and then it's really hard to change it. It's like writing of your left hand if you're right-handed, you know. It, yeah, yeah. You know, uh -huh. Like, you could do it, but it's so awkward and horrible that mm -hmm. you just think, well, why am I wasting my time doing this? I could just do it with my right hand. <laughs> Whereas in Chinese martial arts, it's like, you must do everything on both sides. You know, it, it's very different. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, that's a, that's a great yeah thing about the Bagua. And yeah. So that's yeah, my favorite. But you helped. I mean, with my Shingi, we take that approach anyway. Whereas we start from very constrained. We go up through learning an entire martial art and then free form. So cool. Yeah. I think what you're describing really is the path that every martial art should should actually be. I, I don't think it's it has to be unique to Bagua. I think Bagua is probably more conducive to that free form element at the end than other martial arts because it's yeah. it's flowy, you know, mm -hmm. it's it's flowy and and it's based on movement. But I think really, I think all martial arts should actually be following that 
basic <laughs> progress. It just never happens. Like, you know, I mean, how many Tai Chi people do you know yeah. that free form a Tai Chi form? Mm-hmm. None. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, it's... But that, yeah, I mean, I that hesitate... the ultimate goal, right? I hesitate to say what all martial arts should do. <laughs> but, I mean, I, I agree with you. Pers- for me personally, this is something, yeah, that I'm really into. My, my first kind of career was like classical piano i wanted to be a pianist and i entered the conservatory as a teenager and yeah my, my issue was it was it was like these people you spend your entire life and you're just playing the notes that beethoven wrote in this sonata yeah. and you're following his pedal marks and you're following dynamic things there's like interpretation that goes on within that of course you know but it's so constrained and i had friends who were kind of jazz musicians and they're just like they're just all over the place they're just throwing in crazy stuff and doing these inventing scales and I'm like, that's that's music, man. So I I felt that same way about martial arts uh, always that there should there should be a kind of a, a culminatory kind of improvisational dimension on top of this stuff. But but what I really love about Bagua is that is the pedagogical kind of model leads you all the way there. So a lot of martial arts will be like you have basics, you have the kind of substance of the art, and then you learned it, and it's like okay, now you're free, and you're like, well, what do I do with that? But Bagua has like kind of it goes step by step. And kind of gives you more degrees and degrees of freedom until you're like really kind of improvisatory, you know? Mm. Yeah. I mean, I guess also if you've watched that Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon film, then, you know, Bagua is the, is the martial art that fits the, the bill there, doesn't it? It's, it's, it's the closest to that kind of movement, you know, you saw in that film. Yeah. Yeah. The flowiness of it all. Yeah. I would say so. Yeah. So, um, are you are you going to head back to Wudang at any point in the future, or have you moved on? <laughs> uh, yeah, certainly. Um, yeah, I'd love to go back. I mean, my master built a gigantic new school uh, just uh, during COVID. Huge, like a whole. He built a, a temple basically um, right. next to the spot of one of the the classical temples. Yuzhen Yuzhen Gong kind of burned down not too long before I moved to China, so I never actually saw it. The Temple of Encountering Perfection. And Sufu got a plot of land very close to it and built out a whole temple as like dormitories for 500 students or something like that. Mm-hmm. So I would love to go back and see that and visit Sifu. Yeah, not not this year, but I'll definitely make it back sometime soon. And a lot of my students here want to go as well. Now that they're, they're finally kind of opening up visa restrictions for foreigners after COVID and stuff like that, they're trying to drum up international tourism again. Mm. So yeah, definitely. I suppose it will be the case that you'll go back there and it'll everything will have changed and you'll be like, I remember when this is all fields and <laughs> Oh yeah. No, it's completely different from what I've heard because my, my Kung Fu brother Jake has, has stayed in China the whole time. Right. And yeah, he said it's just completely different. I mean there's like a Starbucks, there's a subway in Wudang. There was nothing there when I was there. I would have chilled to have a Starbucks. <laughs> um so yeah. What it was, was a lot more cushy? Yeah, well, so what, what what was it like? Was it like re- was the heating, or was it just a bed and um, some walls and yeah, bed and some walls? Yeah, we weren't uh, we didn't have heating or air conditioning in our rooms, and we weren't allowed to use space heaters because they would just like blow the fuses mm. uh, and jack up Sifu's electricity bill. <laughs> I think that had more to do with it. Yeah, so in the winter we just like froze our asses off, and we would heat ourselves by doing kung fu and meditation, which uh, you know. It, when you're in your 20s, you can deal with that. I would never do that again, but it's a cool memory to have, but yeah, there's a lot of yeah. suffering at the time. Yeah, well, yeah. yeah, goodness, it sounds tough. Yeah. And and, the, and like you've talked about the meditation before, which is, I, I loved your story, which is that for three years, he just said, sit down and be still. Yeah. And that was like the yeah. you know, instruction he gave you for three yeah. years. And then somebody asked him, some new guy turned up for a week, asked him, okay, so what do I do next? Then he started just telling him. And you were all like, well, we've been waiting three years for you to tell us what to do yeah. next, Sifu. And then, yeah. well, you never asked me. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, that's how Sifu went. Yeah. Yeah, he was always, I mean, he talked about it. Like, there's a, a long history in Taoism of masters, like, intentionally making things difficult for their disciples. Yeah. As part of, like, it's like, it's part of Taoist pedagogy. It's this shirku. It's like eating bitter. It's really, really valued. And so he, he did that for us. And so that was one of the ways he would do it. Um, and so you just always had to be kind of on your toes, just waiting for Sifu to drop a pearl. Yeah. Um, because we were there for so long and he dropped them so infrequently that, <laughs> yeah. Fun. Like, did he never, I mean, cause I, I mean, I, I, I'm like you, I'd probably just wait for him to drop a pearl of wisdom 
Yeah. I wouldn't go and ask him. I'm not that sort of person. Whereas a lot of people that I meet in martial arts, like they just come up to me with the most inappropriate questions. Like, like the other day, the other day, I was just we were just training. We just finished training. We came off the mat, and this this new white belt goes. So, so when do I get my next stripe then? I was like, <laughs> don't ask when you get your next stripe. You, you never ask about promotions. You just wait till uh-huh. the, the teacher thinks you're ready. You know, is that? Whereas, yeah. What, what what do you think would happen if you just asked him what he did next after sitting here in in complete stillness? Would he just give you a like a brushing off sort of answer, or would he have actually have just said, "Well, now you have to do the next thing"? And yeah, he would certainly not do the latter. He wouldn't tell you what you wanted to know. Um, right. But uh, a lot of a lot of times he had this. Um, he just said, "You don't ask this question." That that's like how he would fra- frame it. Um, and it was specifically about uh, my my class, or the, the kind of twelve of us, is like cl- kind of inner disciples and stuff like that. Because it's really, it's yeah, it's like how he said, it's like not, it's like bad form to mm. to ask your master for for these sorts of things. Um, and so yeah, you just kind of uh, sit around. Uh, so you're kind of encouraged um, through the kind of ambient culture to be like a baby bird. To just like sit there with like your mouth open, like waiting for something, you know. Yeah. yeah. But but if you just do that, then uh, you're you're not anything. So at the same time, you have to really kind of use your own effort to to kind of study and kind of. For me, I I just took notes on everything Sifu ever said, mm-hmm. and I didn't. It, this stuff didn't make any sense at the time. But then uh, now I have this huge body of of notes, and I kind of can synthesize this stuff. And that's what actually I produced all of this stuff on on my website based on the kind of research I, I did while I was in China in, in this sort of way. And so, yeah, Fu, is, he's extremely unsystematic. I characterize him as like an apophatic mystic. Like he doesn't, he, he thinks language is completely not up to the task of talking about anything worthwhile. Mm. Um, and and books are pretty much a waste of time that are just like bad for you as, for the most part. And so his relationship to knowledge is like a, a difficult one. And to have a master like that, to study under them, is very difficult, especially when you're someone kind of systematic and taxonomical, like I am. So, mm-hmm. but we, we form a good pair because at the end of the day, he he just teaches through this kind of process of osmosis, and then I take this stuff and I kind of array it in kind of columns and rows and uh, kind of try to m- make sense of it, you know? Yeah, my, my Tai Chi teacher was very much like that as well. Which yeah, you know, if he ever saw you with a book, a Tai Chi book, he would literally take it off you and then crank it <laughs> and just walk off. <laughs> You know, like, like yeah. you weren't allowed to read it. And like, but he, uh-huh. Yeah, but he kind of wouldn't go, you're not allowed to read books. He would just take them off you and, and like, yeah. never see it again, you know. <laughs> <laughs> this will just That's confuse crazy. you, take it away. <laughs> yeah, precisely. Yeah. Confusion is the point. He was actually English, but I think he was more Chinese in some respects than most Chinese people. Like, his his approach to teaching was very Chinese, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I, I had the same experience of um, standing meditation. It's just like, just stand there. Okay, I'm, I'm just saying, what? No, just stand there. <laughs> stand there. And then in a couple of moments, tell me what you feel. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's the that's the uh, sort of traditional approach, isn't it? It's, um, and it's not conducive to modern life at all. You know, <laughs> like it's not how people, it wasn't how people really did things back in the 70s and 80s but it's even less like people do things now isn't it like oh yeah everything's so quick now everything is so driven by instant results and instant feedback and all that kind of you know the online world <laughs> yeah yeah the proliferation of like data and how knowledge has become a kind of uh like a, a commodity a form of uh, entertainment like knowledge is entertainment now Mm. Um, to to engage with the master for whom knowledge is like it's not even on the map. Like the, knowledge doesn't matter at all. Like the knowledge of like how to sit, you can explain this in forty five seconds. Now you have all the knowledge, all the theoretical knowledge you need to do this practice for the next three years. You know, mm. um, but what I mean, what that what that does, what forcing us to do that, it really just kind of introduces you to the raw kind of data of of your own sensory experience. Yeah. Um, you're your own field researcher aren't you yeah yeah how do you find teaching because obviously you're coming from that tradition mm-hmm. you know in wudang and then you're in british columbia teaching this stuff to people who aren't in that location 
So how, how do you, do you, do you change what you teach? Do you change the style of teaching or do you just keep it as crazy wisdom? <laughs> oh, so I change it. I change it 110%. Like, <laughs> it's as different as it could be. Yeah. Basically. Cause yeah, it's, it just doesn't make any sense to, to do that way. I mean, yeah, in our school, we, we, I've created a, a rigorous curriculum and a belt system. As you know, oh. there's no like, belts in classical Chinese martial arts. No. So, yeah, we have belts. Belts are good. We have a curriculum. Yeah. Belts are great and, for kids, uh, especially kids. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it, it was the kids who requested it, really. So I made it for them, but then it actually, I saw that. So the, the kids have twice as many belts as the adults. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Cool. But the, we still have a, we have just providing some structure to kind of the adult class is nice. And I've, I've systematized and organized our partner drills, which is completely the opposite of how Sifu taught uh, partner training in China. Mm. It was always like, hey, come, hey, check this out, you know? Yeah. And then he'd do something. Yeah. And then, and yeah. like, you know, do that. And like, there's no, I don't know what the name of that technique is. I don't know what the principle he's trying to elucidate is, what is going on. But I took notes on it anyway. And now I've, I'm like, oh, that technique is called this in the form and blah, blah, blah. So now I've kind of put the knowledge together uh, in ways that, that makes sense um, to, to Westerners for sure. Yeah. 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 I mean, that's, that's, that's really interesting. And I, you know, I think that's, the, if you're going to do it in a way that is a success, because Brazilian Jiu Jitsu is such a success as a martial art. I think a lot of that is down to belts. Like mm -hmm. people want the next belt. It just keeps, it's just, it's just some little carrot on a stick that's always just in front of you where you yeah. want to get mm -hmm. to, you know, it's, it's, it's that if humans kind of need that, like it's almost a distraction. Because without it, you'll get you'll just do this. Too, there's too many other distractions that will take you away from what you're trying to do. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. it, it's a great yeah. Whoever invented the belt system, <laughs> which I think I think looking back, it was probably the British Army. <laughs> oh really? <laughs> well, oh, interesting. Well, this this there's this side. You know, um, the whole belt thing came about in Japan. I think like after the war when there was a lot of a lot of. Um, you know, Western soldiers will be strutting about doing drills, like line drills that look very like kata, if you think of them that way, you know. <laughs> and then, you know, the this is just a theory of mine, is that they, in the army, have ranks, right? Mm -hmm. And then you think, well, I get promoted to the next rank, and then I get a, a different, like, stripe on my uniform or somewhere. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, it's, it's like the whole the idea of belt. It's the, they, they all sort of happened at the same time, and I'm I kind of think it's not unrelated. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's an interesting, interesting genealogy. Yeah, yeah. There's there's a lot of evidence that savat was one of the things that influenced karate as well, and that came over through the through the armed forces being practiced mm -hmm. on boats and things. Someone wrote a very good article about that in the martial arts studies journal, which mm. it sounds ridiculous that savat somehow influenced the high kicks in karate, but there's a lot of evidence for it. You know, <laughs> these people were in the same place at the same time. You know, yeah, yeah. They must have seen each other. <laughs> huh. Right. Cool, yeah. man. Wow. Great. Um, well, I think we've we've been talking about an hour. I like to keep this okay. podcast to about an hour. I think like we could go on forever, but we want sure. to be rambling at this point. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anything else you want to add? Uh, no, yeah, I was just, I was here to chat about whatever, you, whatever came up, man. And yeah, the Jiang San Feng stuff, the kind of Wudong history, it's, it's all really interesting stuff. And I'm really happy there are people out there like you and we're kind of, we're getting a little more sophisticated about talking about this stuff nowadays, do you know? Absolutely. Yeah. Like, like you say, we're, we're not talking, we're trying to not get trapped in frameworks as we talk, we're trying to look at the big picture that, you know, these are yeah. competing, um, um, miasmas, as my friend Damon would say. <laughs> Cool. Yeah, that requires a whole hour to explain what he means by that, but <laughs> <laughs> involving the esoteric history of the Western world. But let's just move on to say it's that lenses, lenses through history, you know. Okay, sounds good. Yeah. yeah. So let people know where they can find you. It's yeah, Okanagan Valley Wudang dot com with a G on the end of Wudang, with the D on the yeah G on the end of Wudang. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's your website, and if anyone is in the area and wants to learn the arts of Wudang, you can yeah. learn them in Canada now, so there you go. Amazing. Absolutely, Penticton, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. So um, thanks for doing this. Uh, thank you for your time. I know you're renovating your school at the moment, and time is yeah. a valuable commodity, so thank you for 
<laughs> it's funny. This, this was a yeah. This was a nice break from a construction project. So, thanks, Graham. Yeah. Well, thank you. Uh,